Good afternoon. I think we're going to go ahead and get started on what I think is going to be a fascinating discussion. So, the activities of Iran last summer in the Persian Gulf, cat and mouse attacks on shipping and oil pipelines, the downing of a U.S. drone, the spectacular drone and cruise missile attack on Saudi Aramco in September, focus world atta attention less on Tehran's actions than on Washington's inaction. Indeed, the president's own statements lauding U.S. energy independence of Gulf oil seem to indicate a 40-year security commitment by successive U.S. administrations to the Persian Gulf was unceremoniously being shelved. As rising tensions between Iran and the U.S. jostled global oil markets, Washington and Europe talked fractiously and irresolutely of competing maritime security regimens to safeguard their own pieces of global commerce transiting the Gulf. Meanwhile, in Iraq, months of attacks on U.S. military training sites by an Iranian-backed militia culminated in the death of an American. Ten days of rapid-fire U.S. and Iranian reactions, actions and reactions ensued, appearing to bring the U.S. and Iran to the brink <coughs> of direct military confrontation. A militia assault on Embassy Baghdad, leading to a U.S. drone strike on Qasem Soleimani, leading to an Iranian missile strike against U.S. forces in Iraq. The first such conventional Iranian strike on the U.S. military since April 1988. And there the dust settled. And deterrence, according to the administration, has been restored. Or has it? Today we're very fortunate to have three distinguished speakers with us to parse the dilemmas posed by an Iran that has seemingly mastered the dark arts of asymmetrical warfare and that persists in challenging the U.S. security guarantee, to the extent it still exists, to our Gulf partners. What can the U.S. do to manage escalation, catalyze diplomacy, and use the military instrument to advance its maximum pressure policy while achieving maximum deterrence? And how does the crisis with Iran affect Washington's deterrence posture and alliance relationships elsewhere in the world? Dr. Corey Shockey is a resident scholar and the director of foreign and defense policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute, which she joined fortuitously following her tenure, tenure as Deputy Director General of London's IISS. Dr. Shaka has had a distinguished career in government at the Departments of State and Defense and at NSC, as well as in academia at Stanford, West Point, SAIS, and the National Defense University. She is also the author of five books, among them America versus the West, Can the Liberal, Liberal World Order Be Preserved? Lieutenant General David Deptula is a dean of the Mitchell Institute of Aerospace Studies. During 34 years of service in the U.S. Air Force, he was the principal attack planner for the Operation Desert Storm Air Campaign, commander of no-fly zone operations over Iraq in the late 90s, and director of the air campaign over Afghanistan in 2001. During his last assignment in the Air Force, as the first deputy chief of staff for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, Lieutenant General Deptula oversaw the transformation of America's military ISR and drone enterprises. And last but not least, our own Michael Eisenstadt is the David Kahn and Douglas Kahn Fellow and Director of the Washington Institute's Military and Security Pro Studies Program. A specialist in Persian Gulf and Arab-Israeli security affairs, he has published widely on irregular and conventional warfare and nuclear we weapons proliferation in the Middle East. He served for 26 years as an officer in the U.S. Army Reserve before retiring in 2010. His military service included active duty stints in Iraq with the US, USFI headquarters and the Human Terrain Systems Assessment Team. In Israel, the West Bank and Jordan with the U.S. Security Coordinator for Israel and the Palestinian Authority, at U.S. CENTCOM headquarters and on the Joint Staff during Operation Enduring Freedom and the planning for Operation Iraqi Freedom, and in Turkey and Iraq during Operation Provide Comfort. Dr. Shake, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be among you, my friends. Uh, I think I'll start by uh, grading the administration's homework uh, on the Suleimani strike. It seems to me that their theory of the case was that Suleimani is uniquely able to strategize, uh, build alliances, and execute asymmetric warfare throughout the Middle East, that he has effectively built strategic depth for Iran. And I think that's right. Uh, I 
my own view is that he had probably already surpassed the zenith of the success of that strategy, both because he was getting arrogant enough to want credit for it, right, all those Instagram posts, um, and also because they had reached the expanse of terrain in <coughs> which there were Shia populations to disaffected with the governance in their countries that they could capitalize on. I thought it was an extraordinarily heartening sign that the protests in both Lebanon and Iraq were um, incorporated Shia communities. I think that tells me that it might have been possible to leave Soleimani in place and let his strategy fail, leave him in place, couple it with uh, our anti-Al-Qaeda strategy of killing all the number twos one after another, um, and let and have his strategy fail. But that leaves out the very important fact that the administration had not overtly responded to Iranian attacks on neutral shipping, the attack on the Saudi Aramco facilities, and America's allies in the region and beyond um, were really nervous about the corrosion of deterrence that us not explicitly responding to explicit attacks on our interests and our friends had created. Um, the third thing I'll say about the administration strategy is it looked to me like they navigated the signaling and the escalation management in the immediate aftermath of the Soleimani kill extraordinarily well. That uh, I was really nervous because I would not have anticipated that that would be a strong suit of this administration. Um, and the messages they were sending through the Swiss, that like it looks to me like both the Iranian panicky official statement that the missile strike, the missile retaliation would be the only thing they did, um, was stabilizing and was uh, initiated by the administration's outreach, and I think that's a good thing. Of course, that's not going to be the all that the Iran does in retaliation, because if they allowed that to be all that their retaliation encompassed, it would prove the administration's case that Soleimani was uniquely able to mobilize asymmetric responses. And so if I were the Iranian leadership, I would return to the status quo ante, and it looks like they have more missiles on the embassy in Baghdad, uh, more pressure uh, with militia groups throughout the region, all the kinds of things that Soleimani and the Iranians have been doing since they declared war on the United States in 1979. Um, and uh, what does this mean for the region? Well, I think um, the Gulf states are once again learning the lesson that the Kurds learn about every 10 years and America and the Pakistanis learn about every seven years, which is the United States isn't a very reliable ally if uh, your values don't overlap quite deeply with American values. And even then, it's a pretty dicey prospect. Uh, so, um, uh, so allies in the region and beyond are, for example, not lining up to join the American Maritime Force, as Ambassador Leaf pointed out. There are more countries in the French-led European <coughs> Union Maritime Force in the Gulf than in the United States one. And that's a real telling sign that the administration's fundamental reassurance strategy, which is deploying 14,000 additional military troops to the region and targeted killings of, um, of uh, enemies of the United States and our allies, that's insufficient, right? We are, we are providing a form of reassurance that is getting more expensive because it's not our military capability that's making people nervous, it's our political reliability and we're not doing anything to shore up the political re reliability. Um, so the advice I would give the administration uh, is it, this is a good time for a lot of hand-holding and a lot of 
uh, leading from behind, if you will. The Obama administration was so stupid to allow that to be the descriptor of their policy, but it's also a pretty good American policy. That is to support friends, strengthen friends, and stand quietly behind them, investing them in our strength. We do that too little, and now would be a good time to do a lot of it in the Middle East. Maybe I'll stop there. Thanks very much. General Deptula. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the kind introduction, Ambassador, and Mike, thanks for the uh, invitation uh, to be here, and Corey, thanks for the uh, uh, insightful <laughs> remarks. Um, I'm gonna take a little bit different twist, give you a little bit of, of perspective from uh, uh, someone who spent a lot of time in the military, and I'll start right off with my bottom line up front, and that's what I believe, and I think most in here would agree with me, that the chance of an all-out war with Iran is not high. Uh, regime survival is Tehran's key objective, and the Trump administration has no appetite for another war in the Middle East. Now, yes, uncontrolled escalation is possible, but it's not likely. Now, the reason for this situation is that President Trump set a red line with Iran, no U.S. casualties, warned Iran not to cross it. When they did, he acted as promised to defend American personnel and interests. And then, as Corey mentioned, um, they worked, the administration worked the escalation management to, to a degree that I think surprised a lot of people uh, in the context of, of managing it fairly well. Now, the action to eliminate uh, Soleimani, uh, I would suggest, needs to be put in the context of a three-part strategy. Uh, one, to constrain Iran's malign activities. Two, to roll back Iran's influence in the reason. And ultimate, three, ultimately deter further Iranian aggression. And I am a believer that the deterrent element is especially uh, important. Uh, and for deterrence to work, I think uh, uh, the, the Iranian leadership needs to understand that the United States will actually use its power. But let me offer some observations looking forward, if you will, uh, and, and make some uh, perspectives in that context. First, I would suggest to you, and, and, and Corey did this much more uh, diplomatically is probably not the right word, but insightfully uh, and uh, elegantly than I might, but I would tell you that Suleimani is not replaceable in the short term. Uh, he was Iran's top terrorist, an influential military persona, the leader of Iranian revolutionary ideology, and yeah, I mean, you get me thinking in the context, he may have peaked out, um, but the fact of the matter is he was a strategic mind driving much of Iran's strategy, uh, and now we're going to have our less adept Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps subordinates who are going to take over his roles. Second. American leadership needs to prepare their next steps to deter conflict um, with Iran. I was extraordinarily surprised uh, when I observed several on the national stage who were pandering fear of potential Iranian reaction to Soleimani's death. The fear of possible consequences should not outweigh the logic that forceful action is sometimes necessary to defend U.S. personnel and interests. Uh, particularly to shore up the value of deterrence. The reality is that taking no action, as, as some uh, advocated, would have increased the odds for further uh, Iranian aggression. So I think it's important to grasp the nature of deterrence uh, and also realize that we're not going to deter Iran through inaction. And although no sane individual wants to see open warfare between the U.S. and Iran, the best way to avoid that outcome is to convince Iran's leadership that continued aggression uh, will come at an increasingly high cost on their part. Third, and it's pretty obvious to everybody in this room, and it appears it is the Iranian leadership too, uh, at any point in time, the U.S. can impose devastating effects on Iran. Such operations uh, will not be easy, and they would incur risk, but they're wholly attainable. Iran, on the other hand, is a weak nation without the material resources required to pose a similar threat to the U.S. Obviously, that's the principal reason why they use proxies and terrorism uh, to conduct their business. 
Iran's leaders must be made to realize that continued violence will result in the rapid application of force against key elements of their regime. Fourth, America's security leadership needs to move beyond anachronistic military conventions that associate warfare with large numbers of soldiers on the ground as its primary element. Now, don't misinterpret me here, okay? I believe uh, that to retain our position of leadership in the world, we need to have the strongest Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps in the world. But using those forces needs to be conditioned to the particular circumstances at the time, all right? Jointness is using the right force at the right place at the right time. It's not using every force, every place, every time. Um, with proper application, the effects of lethal force with modern aerospace power supplemented by offensive cyber operations can result in the collapse of the Iranian economy, negation of their military, denuding of their nuclear programs, and choking of their regional influence. Iran's critical oil refining capacity, oil distribution network, and power grid can all be rendered ineffective by these means in short order without any U.S. boots on the ground. Finally, there must be clarity about the character of conflict with Iran if, in fact, we're pushed to do that by further aggression against U.S. personnel and interests. I would suggest that dealing with Iran militarily should not follow the strategies applied over the last 19 years in Afghanistan and Iraq. This tends to be what worries people. Those strategies involve deploying hundreds of thousands of ground forces to conduct prolonged occupation, nation building, and counterinsurgency operations. None of those are applicable in Iran. Rather, any action necessary in Iran should be modeled after the decisive takedown of Iraq applied in Desert Storm in 91. So a lot of difference between those, those situations. Uh, we have to stop equating strategy with numbers of U.S. boots on the ground. Its rapid accomplishment of desired effects should be the goal if the use of lethal force is required. So I would suggest the best way to deter Iran now uh, is the supplement, to supplement the power projection capability of uh, U.S. air forces in the region in order to project lethality without projecting vulnerability. And in fact, that's what we've done quietly or not so quietly uh, since the events of early January. And I think the mullahs are getting the message. So with that, I'll pass it to Mike. Thanks, Dave, and thanks for two excellent presentations, which um, really set me up very well. I guess I'll start with my own bottom line up front, which is um, the United States needs to counter Iran's gray zone counter pressure campaign with our own gray zone campaign, which focuses on covert action, um, incremental gains, um, uh, incremental cumul cumulative gains through low-level actions below the radar screen, which is made necessary by our domestic politics, by the regional operational environment, and by the long-term desire of the United States to increasingly focus on the Indo-Pacific region, which means that in the long run, we're going to have less force in the Middle East in the long run, um, or at least you know, unless this Iran thing repeats itself every year for the next decade. So any, anyhow, let, let me just go, you know, to, to start, let me just first um, talk a little bit about Iran's counter-pressure campaign, which um, started of May of, of last year in response to our maximum pressure campaign. Um, it was in response to our efforts to drive oil down, oil, Iranian oil exports down to zero. This crossed for Iran, a longstanding red line since the Iran-Iraq war that if we can't export oil, nobody's going to export oil from the Gulf. Um, and it caused them to respond militarily in a number of ways with the goal, I think, of trying to induce the United States to lift their east sanctions. So there were four line of operations that Iran has been involved in since last May. First of all, attacks on oil. We saw limpet mining and diversion of tankers, as well as attacks on oil infrastructure using drones and cruise missiles. Other types of military attacks, such as multiple attempts to sh shoot down drones, including one successful shoot down of an American Global Hawk drone, and as well as the use of IED and rocket attacks against American personnel in Iraq. Third line of operation is cyber activities, mainly net reconnaissance activities, both to signal to the United States that it has the ability to do destructive 
cyber attacks against critical infrastructure, and also to gain the information needed and perhaps to pave the way for those attacks should they decide to do them in the future. And then finally, ramping up their nuclear program again, although this, I see this as kind of like a, a separate track on its own, which has its own timeline and logic. As the Iranians said last May, every 60 days we're going to be doing something else, and they've kept to that timeline, so it's not really responsive to the other stuff going on um, between the United States and Iran. Now, in this counter-pressure campaign, Iran has made extensive use of what we call gray zone activities that enable it to challenge the status quo by man by managing, while managing risk, reducing the potential for escalation, and avoiding war. Gray zone actors test and probe to determine what they can get away with. They create ambiguity through covert or proxy activities and through incremental action, and they avoid becoming decisively engaged militarily. The net result is to create uncertainty in, adva in, in adversaries with regard to how to respond, and this has been a problem we've had for 40 years with Iran, okay, going back to the Marine barracks bombing and, and, and Hobart Towers and the like. And Iran really, since 79, has distinguished itself as perhaps the foremost gray zone actor in the world today. Now, these gray zone uh, operations are possible because, and they succeed because America adheres to a binary view of war and peace, and it's rooted in our culture, our history, and our legal system, and our constitution. So you're either at war or you're at peace, okay? Which creates a lot of gray area between for adversaries to act in. You know, is a cyber attack an act of war, and should we respond militarily to it? Are acts of terrorism whose attribution is not clear, at least initially, things that we, you know, should respond to militarily. Maybe it wasn't approved at the highest level of the Iranian regime, and do we want to get into a war that, you know, as a result of an action by a rogue actor? So these are all the kind of, you know, they, they end up tying us in knots because of these kind of uncertainties, okay? The roots of their, their gray zone approach is rooted, in my mind, at least mainly in the trauma of the Iran-Iraq war, whose wounds are still fresh in Iran. And as a result, the regime has gone through great uh, lengths to avoid conventional warfare because it knows how bloody and costly they can be from its own experience and then also watching the United States in Iraq and, Af and, and Afghanistan. Easy in, not so easy out necessarily. And when it has to fight, it prefers to do so on foreign soil, far from its borders, and to rely on proxies to do the heavy lifting. Okay? And we've seen that in Syria, in spades, where Hezbollah has lost four times the number of men as I Iran has there. All this means that in the current situation that we find ourselves, while there's a, and I agree with the other speakers here, that while there's a potential for escalation and broader conflict with Iran, an all-out war, as uh, uh, Foreign Minister Zarif has warned and lots of people in the, in the United States have warned of, I think is unlikely unless the U.S. opts for it, unless we choose to go that route. And I just don't see the president, um, you know, and, and this is one area, this is one thing on which I take him at his word, I don't see him, you know, looking for this kind of conflict. So I mentioned before, you know, we've always struggled um, to deal with Iran's gray zone approach, and likewise, this administration is no exception. Um, we see this in the lack of consistency in our approach since May. First, not responding in the physical domain, at least, until um, the, uh, the, the strike in response to the Qatab Hezbollah, um, the, the protests at the embassy, excuse me, the killing of the American contractor, which led to the strike against Qatab Hezbollah, uh, facilities in Iraq and Syria, and then the killing of uh, Qasem Soleimani. Um, so I think the way I see it, we went from excessive um, restraint to perhaps overkill, perhaps. It might turn out that the killing of Soleimani was an act of uh, genius, and it might turn out well, and maybe not. I think it's still too early. We may not know for a year. But in general, I think, you know, for reasons that I'll explain in a minute, it's better for the United States to act at a, at a lower level and prevent escalation than to respond to an escalatory act by the adversary with, uh, with something which could be potentially be even more escalatory, potentially, okay. Um, now, the killing of Qasem Soleimani raised a host of issues and added another layer of complexity to an already complex situation. I mentioned you had the ongoing Iranian counter-pressure campaign, and now you have, you know, the imperative of, of revenge. Are the Iranians done? Maybe, maybe not, we don't know. And maybe they think they're done, and maybe they'll change their mind down the road, or, or maybe not. Certainly, the file with regard to Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis al has not been closed. And we, we can expect the axis of resistance, as we heard, to try to avenge his loss. Okay? There's also the potential of that the separate conflict tracks between Israel and Iran in the Levant, and U.S. Um, and Iran in the Gulf and in Iraq could converge at some future point. There's also the impact of U.S. and Iranian domestic politics on the calculus of both 
parties. We have elections in the U.S. and Iran. Iran has parliamentary elections this month and um, uh, presidential elections next year. We have a presidential election coming, coming up. That will affect the calculus of the actors. You have an ongoing power struggle in, in Iran with the, con the attempt by kind of conservative hardliners to consolidate their role, and we see that playing out in the exclu exclusion of pragmatic conservatives from the, the list running for uh, elections in the, in, the, in, the, in the majlis, in the parliament. And then you have popular unrest in Iran, as well as Iraq and, and Lebanon, which Tehran believes is part of a U.S.-Saudi-Israeli plot. So how the, I'll give two examples of how all of this stuff is tied together. So usually Iran, historically, in response to a challenge, often takes a month or several months to respond, well-planned, well-thought-out. We saw this time five days, I think it was, after the killing of Soleimani, where you had the, the missile strike on al-Assad Air Base. I think they did that rapidly because given the domestic context in Iran and given the fact they just had the oil protests in November, they couldn't afford to be seen as taking, biding their time on this. They felt they needed to, to show a, a, a strong response in order to um, send a message uh, to the domestic opposition. Okay? Um, you also have the possibility that Tehran might be tempted to launch an October surprise as the elections you know, in the U.S. approach in order to um, perhaps uh, try to cost Trump his re-election, okay? And there's a precedent for this with the hostages in President Jimmy Carter in 1980 and during the presidential campaign in that year, okay? There's also the matter of whether the killing of Soleimani has restored U.S. deterrence or not. Now, the bottom line is, the way I look at it, deterrence is a wasting asset that has a limited shelf life, okay? You always have to tend to it because it will be tested. And the Iranians are, as I mentioned before, they're always testing and probing, okay? So you have to respond always firmly to their tests and probes. And again, that's how I think we got into the problems that we are in now. Had we pushed back against Iranian harassment r attacks in Iraq, it's possible um, with, with our own harassment attacks, measure for measure, it's possible that the uh, American contractor wouldn't have been killed. Okay. Um, there's also the issue of the impact of Soleimani's death on the balance of power within the IRGC and the regime. I'll just note, um, my understanding is that um, uh, the strike on Aramco in Saudi Arabia was done, um, was, was at the initiative of uh, Amir Ali Hajizadeh, who is the aerospace commander of the IRGC. Um, and my understanding is that the, this action was not supported by all members in the IRGC, including Soleimani, but he got his way on this. And he also was the one, his forces were the ones that conducted the strike at al-Assad. So he's a very forward-leaning guy. He's around and Soleimani's not around anymore. What impact does that have on Iran's risk acceptance? I don't know. We'll see. Mm -hmm. But this is something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. And also command and control over proxies. I'll just note there is a tendency towards fragmentation. A lot of these proxies came about, especially in Iraq, because they were kind of splinters of other existing groups that Iran was working with. And they, they work with splinters and, and the like. Um, so it's possible that there might be splinters from the groups that they control well, that they don't control as well, and they might act on their own. But the groups that exist are Khomeinist groups. And Khomeinist, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, you know, Khomeinist groups and Khamenei is, as the supreme leader, is ultimately their ultimate authority, and he's still around. Soleimani was kind of the personal representative in a way of the supreme leader, but, so I, I think, I'm not so worried about the established groups, it's, it's more splinters in terms of rogue, rogue activities. Now also, I Iran faces a number of uh, dilemmas post Soleimani. Their, push their pushback so far has not gained them sanctions relief and perhaps cost them their most talented military leader. The U.S. has shown itself increasingly unpredictable and therefore um, escalation on their part could entail unacceptable risks. So they have to ask themselves whether the killing of Qasem Soleimani was a one-off event you know, by Trump and he's going to eventually be distracted and, and um, you know, go back to strategic patience or whether this is actually part of a new, uh, kind of a new trend that every, you know, major action on their part will be met with a disproportionate response. Also, Iran have to, has to consider, you know, they, they set out their goal, our revenge will be getting the United States out of the Middle East. Now, that's always been their policy going back decades, okay? But they have to ask themselves, if they, do, if they were to succeed in getting the U.S. out of Iraq, they would lose, first of all, useful leverage in the form of 5,000 American, you know, potential hostages, so to speak, to their, their, their proxies. 
there's the possibility of threatened U.S. sanctions on Iraq, which will also hurt Iran at a time that they're, all, you know, they're using Iraq in order to circumvent sanctions. Is that helpful for them? And if ISIS comes back in the next two or three or four years, you know, will the, the, if the U.S. is not around to do the hefty, heavy lifting, they're going to have to do it themselves this time. So is it in their interest, really, to get us out of Iraq? I don't know. I just simply put that out there. That doesn't mean that they're not going to try to perhaps inflict casualties on us again, but I think there's limits to, you know, um, you know th th they could have something such as, you know, Rumsf you know, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld used to say, catastrophic su success there. Okay? So th they have to be careful about what they, what they wish. And if... Trump has a second term, will he, he be unbound in his relationship to them? And therefore, maybe they want to try to do something in October to get rid of him. But if they do something like that, you know, might there be a very high cost because he's fighting for his political life. So let me just um, get to my final points about U.S. strategy and, and the need for U.S. grade zone approach. As I said before, I, I would argue for a below-the-radar approach that involves a lot of covert action and small incremental acts to to um, create and, and to bolster the deterrence that was created by the uh, death of, of Soleimani. Because first of all, I think in terms of our goal of renewing negotiations with Iran, low profile acts below the radar screen are less disruptive to those efforts than high profile actions that kill key members of the regime, which perhaps, you know, again, you, you know, things, things often in the real world don't work out like you think, but, um, you know, those kind of activities might harm efforts to um, re re renew diplomacy with Iran, first of all. Domestic politics, it, make it, it makes this issue a hot, real hot-button issue in the United States. It, for, it further drives polarization, the question of whether the U.S. is seeking a, a war with Iran and the like. So operations below the radar screen are better in terms of our domestic politics. Just a question to you. Syrian oil pipelines have been destroyed in covert actions twice in the last seven or eight months off the coast of Syria. How many of you know that that's happened? Okay, okay so it, it isn't, doesn't even get discussed among the specialists because it, it, it occurs in the shadows and it, wasn't, it didn't create a big uh, uh, you know, dust up. I think that's the better way to act by and large for domestic political reasons. Also for the regional operational environment. We paid a, you know, I don't know if we'll pay a price in terms of our presence in Iraq, but the whole issue of US presence became an issue again Okay, so um, and also the nature of this kind, these type of long-term competitions with Iran are such that they're won on points and not knockout blows. So again, it's better to act below the radar with small operations. And finally, it's it's again more consistent with our desire to shift our forces to the to east uh, to the Indo-Pacific region. We could do a gray zone strategy with smaller forces than are needed than to do um, large overt operations seeking decisive effects. So the elements of a gray zone approach, and these are my final comments, I'm gonna wrap up now. Again, Iran will always test us to, re to ensure that the deterrence remains robust. You have to respond firmly to challenges. Less US restraint emboldens Iran, and then you get more escalation, than you, and you get the outcome actually that you're trying to avoid. Covert, unacknowledged action, if possible, is desirable, although sometimes overt action is necessary. We need to avoid both excessive restraint as well as ex ex escalatory actions. You need a balanced approach, kind of the golden mean in the middle. We need to exploit Tehran's preoccupation with managing risk and the potential for escalation since their whole approach is driven by this. If we act unpredictably and asymmetrically and impose painful costs when we do act, this will increase uncertainty for Iran and prevent them from calibrating risk. And again, they'll, that will reinforce their, their um, in, in, instinct, which is their dominant instinct to, to, to be careful in how they act. Alter their incentive framework, don't corner them, which I think we did, and I don't see the administration willing to kind of ease up on the oil sanctions, um, um, and, and you know, which I think kind of, again, caused the Iranians to start lashing out in May. But again, you, if you push them in a corner and give them no other options, um, that's, that you need to play both ends. You need, to, you need to have robust deterrence, and you also have to not corner them so that they feel they, a need to, to lash out, that they're kind of uh, fighting for their lives. Go long, not big. Seek advantage by incremental cumulative gains and not rapid and decisive action or attempts at knockout blows. And then finally, the last point, expand gray zone options, okay? There's a lot of things we can do rather than vertical escalation in terms of things in the cyber domain, um, activities, covert action uh, that are geographically dispersed, 
that you, you also um, pace your activities over time so that there's, they're not so intense and, and they don't follow one after the other, which again limit the potential for escalation. So I, I think a gray zone approach is the right way to go for a variety of reasons, and I hope um, this will, you know, uh, this presentation and my publication, my monograph on Iran's, uh, you know, gray zone approach and how we can counter it with our own gray zone approach will start to gain, you know, gain some traction and, and cause us to rethink the way we use the military instrument against Iran. So thank you. I, I, over, I went over my time. I apologize. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm going to just kick off with a, a question or two for the panel and then turn to our audience. Uh, something uh, that I think ties uh, Corey and, and, and Mike's uh, discussion together is this issue of whether the U.S. is acting um, to restore deterrence. Uh, I think you both agree, uh, we all agree, that it's not a one-shot deal. It's, uh, it, it, it may have been a salutary strike on January 3rd, but it's insufficient, as such as it is, to, to keep deterrence re d uh, restored. Uh, you have to maintain it, as, as Mike said. But also, can you do it alone? And so uh, you touched, Corey, on this issue of how Europeans and others were looking at the non-actions, uh, non non-response by the U.S. Um, I'd be curious, between you two, whether you think the U.S. can uh, go it alone in terms of restoring deterrence in a number of ways. Does it require uh, a, a, a more public set of activities, collaborative activities with Europe or other actors, Japan, China, et cetera? Um, so the U.S. can go it alone, but it shouldn't. It's more expensive. It's more brittle. Um, and uh, the set of decisions that led up to the Soleimani strike are going to make it harder for others to participate with us, right? Europeans are going to be very, are already very anxious about the international legal implications of targeted killings without the overt uh, agreement of the country in whose force, in whose country, the forces that carried out the strike or pieces of the strike were stationed. Um, so, so it makes it harder for others, for our, the friends we typically go to first for help on stuff, makes it harder for them to support us. Makes it a lot harder for the Iraqis to support us. Um, I have my doubts that the government of Iraq is confident enough that it could handle balancing other factors without American participation. Um, that I doubt the Irani, Iraqi leadership is actually going to force the U.S. out. But they've got a legitimate basis to want greater approval authority to restrict the freedom of activity of American forces. That's what I would ask for if I were them. Um, so, so that relationship gets more difficult. I'll simply note that the Iraqis thought it was a useful thing to have the Russian military leadership come visit in the last couple of days. I think they are understandably trying to show that even if they don't have a better option than partnership with the United States, they at least have other options, and we have to take that into account. Uh, I think almost everyone in the room knows more about the Gulf states than I do, so I would hesitate to posit what what the Gulf states think. I would simply note that they tend to want very, very strident, direct, overt military actions taken until we actually take them. And then they start to get really, really nervous about the consequences. Uh, and so there may be a gap between rhetoric and actual preference uh, on that part. And the other thing is that the last thing I'll say uh, on the go to loan piece is that the intelligence that we get from other countries and that we get from operating in other countries is precious to our ability to do a whole bunch of things we want. And we there is a, an aggregating cost uh, to how we are doing things in the world that's going to make it harder the next time, for example, Dave Deptula, that we want to round up a posse and go do something like the 91 Iraq Gulf War. Okay, great. 
Well, I, ho I hope you'll uh, also chime in, Barbara, on, on, on the golf golfies on, on this one, because I'd be very interested to hear your, your thoughts on that. But I, you know, I, I'll just answer this by reminding us of what happened in 2017 in Syria, where my perception is you had an attempt to test the new president, um, Donald Trump. We had, if you remember, there were a series of probes and tests <coughs> of our small garrison at Tanf along the border between Syria and, and Jordan. We have some, spe you know, 100 or 200 special forces and SA SAS guys there. So the Iranians sent armed drones, or they may have been pro-Iranian militias, armed drones in the direction. We shot down, I think, at least two of them with F-15s. They also sent um, convoys in that direction within our exclusion zone. They were attacked by our forces. Um, elsewhere in Syria, at about the same time, we shot down a Syrian SA-20, excuse me, SU-22 fighter by Top Gadam when we were supporting the, P, uh, the PYD guys or YPG guys. And then we did the Wagner. Um, you know, we killed the Wagner guys, a couple of hundred in Deir Ezzor. Those were Syrians unrelated to Iran. But I think the message with, that Iran took was don't mess with the U.S. Now, these were all force protection measures. This was not part of a geopolitical gambit of any sort. But I think they realized that, you know, they, they, they needed to tread lightly with, with uh, President Trump. And as a result, I think we see at, this, at about that time, the Iranians start focusing on their building up Syria as a springboard against Israel, and they ramped up some of their kind of the Cold War with Saudi Arabia at the time, which I think it was the message is if you, you know, um, you know, if we can't hurt you, we're going to hurt your friends, okay? So the problem we face now is that our approach of saying you guys are on your own creates a seam, okay? So they will tread very carefully with us, but they are able to be much more uh, aggressive with um, our, 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 you know, Gulf friends and, and, and allies. The Israelis pretty much can defend themselves, but, you know, we, we've seen the Saudis don't have that ability. And right now, there's no AUMF. To, you know, to cover U.S. military force to protect our friends in the Gulf. And this is also given the politics of U.S.-Saudi relations. This is a very fraught issue. So there's a scene there to, to be exploited. So I think there are structural problems in our whole approach to um, deterrence. We, we were able to, I think, deter, as I, as I said, from Syria, and as we've seen perhaps now um, for at least for a short while with regard to um, Iran as a result of the uh, Soleimani killing, we might have restored deterrence. But like I said, deterrence is a wasting asset, and there are other targets that they could um, strike that will have an impact on our interests. Because again, our relationship with the Gulf states, I think, has has suffered. And I, again, if you want to say something, yeah, that, that's that's, that's my thought. question about uh, going alone. Because in fact, um, to to the issue of uh, we 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 touched on earlier, the the immediate uh, European. Uh, reaction to the suggestion in the summer uh, that we put together a maritime security uh, regime, uh, the, the reaction was hostile. Uh, it, was, you know, it was nothing short of hostile uh, in terms of French, German, and, and British statements, which engendered a counter response of some hostility from the administration. That's a very bad uh, piece of theater to be playing out uh, in front of the Iranians and our Gulf partners who were quite anxious uh, in the wake of even just the, you know, the May 12th uh, limpet mine uh, attacks on tankers, which didn't do lasting danger. What it was a, it was a salutary and simple message to the UAE, and then followed two days later a similar message to the the Saudis um, by the uh, m small attack on the East West Pipeline. Those were messages that were passed and repassed all summer long. Every uh, every time, every tanker that was hit, every piece of energy infrastructure that was touched was related to Saudi Arabia and UAE. So tankers coming to and from those uh, those places. So the message was passed and received, and then you had this uh, squabbling in public between the U.S. and Europe over whether anybody would do anything collective. And the the, the grand upshot was nobody did much of anything. Um, including after uh, the strike uh, on Saudi Aramco. On the one hand, the Iranians were looking to, to, to goose the international community as well as send a message to the Gulf partners that we can hit you where we want, when we want. And in a sense, uh, that might have 
been disappointed. The reaction might have been disappointing in in a sense after September 14th because oil markets moved and then and then and then recovered, and the U.S. did nothing and people, um, you know, turned back to um, regularly scheduled programming. So um, so thus the the dust up at the end of December and January, uh, leading eventually to the killing of Qasem Soleimani. Yeah, that was that was. Uh, uh, a salutary shot in the arms for our Gulf partners, but it is not enough. I wonder, uh, David, if you want to comment on the issue of, you you mentioned that uh, you you laid out deterrence, restoring deterrence, but you also talked about rolling back Iranian influence. And I, I look at those two things as very, very s separate propositions, because if you look at Iraq as an example, you've got an influence that is salted away in all levels of the Iraqi government and the economy um, and even society um, in a way that's it's been a project of 16 years making. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not suggesting that um, deterrence is going to fix that piece. Uh, what I'm trying to subtly suggest is a strategy that includes that as a piece of the overarching strategy. Okay, okay. okay so. As uh, a starting point. Yeah, right. The deterrence piece as a starting point going into Correct. The, the, the wider objectives. Right. right. Questions? Yes. Uh, I have uh, a comment and <coughs> two questions. Comment is uh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, Corey uh, gave the, the most generous assessment of the Trump foreign policy that I think I've seen, although I, I would not suggest that she has a high opinion of its performance in general. But for a student of Thomas Schelling to say that they handled the signaling well uh, is very high praise indeed. <laughs> um, two questions. Uh, first, for General Deptula, uh, insofar as you are free to say, may not be very far, um, if uh, the Iranians make a dash for the bomb, and if the American president decides to stop it with an air campaign, what would that campaign look like, as I say, insofar as you're able to describe it? Uh, and second, and this is for the, the whole panel, including the uh, moderator, um, if the United States should either seriously try to to negotiate, to renegotiate the, uh, the Iran nuclear deal, or if it should decide that it is politically useful for coalition maintenance to have a public position, uh, what changes should it seek to the JCPOA? Um, I'll, I'll make an attempt to answer your first question and then my panel uh, partners here uh, jump in on the second one. And you put me in an awkward position, um, not intentionally, I know that, but uh, unfortunately I'm not going to answer your question because th this is public and I wouldn't even want to give an inkling to those that are listening as to how we might go about doing that successfully. Um, but I think it is within the realm of the possible. Um, as I mentioned in my remarks, any military uh, action uh, will be challenging. Uh, and so I don't want to leave the impression that any of this is going to be easy. Um, we tend to make things look easy, but in fact they're incredibly uh, complex and uh, complicated. But I'll, I'll pass on giving any insights on how we might do that. Now on a sidebar, uh, maybe we can chat. Uh, so. What I would love to see in a renegotiated nuclear deal with Iran is uh, challenge inspections, inspections of military facilities, um, because the inspection regime, I think, is, for me at least, much more important than the sunset clause or capturing other elements that had not been included, like ballistic missiles. I think there are other ways to deal with those things, but the uh, I would want a much higher degree of confidence uh, that we would find it if they were doing it, 
because while the inspection provisions of the JCPOA were were much better than we had, much better than the IAEA could have anticipated, I still am bearing the scars of the revelations after 1991 about how far Iraq had gotten in its nuclear program, despite having been appeared compliant for a, a considerable period of time with the IAEA. So I would go for much more expansive um, uh, and much more challenging inspections than the agreement had. I'll just I'll just add to that by uh, saying and I, I agree with uh, you know what Corey said on that one. Um, you know, an administration is going to have to also decide with regard to do you um, negotiate to keep permanent caps on the program so that it remains a symbolic program basically, um, ad, ad you know kind of uh, forever, or do you just push back the sunset clause? You get you know try for another twenty or thirty years to buy time, okay? Um, Obviously, it would be preferable that it's, it remains a symbolic program. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm not sure, you know, the, the president, I think, would, would, will want a deal um, if, if, if it gets to negotiations. And so he, he might be, you know, tempted to kind of um, agree to an extension of the sunset clause. Then you got surface-to-surface -surface missiles, which I think that's, you know, there's ways to kind of finesse that. I, I, I don't see, to be honest with you, I... I'm skeptical we can get much of an agreement on that because it's so important to Iran's um, defenses. Um, and um, they, you know, for them, that's kind of a, a, a deal breaker. They might say, they claim that they have had a 2,000 kilometer limit since 2012. And we might just say, fine, keep that, you know, keep that um, you know, in place uh, on an open-ended basis. The problem is they do have a, a, a missile um, based on the BM-25 system that the North Koreans have also launched. I think they call it Khoramshar uh, with Farzin, is it the Khoramshar? Um, that has a, actually a greater range than that. Uh, but anyhow, there's ways of finessing that, that you know, that y you can claim victory when it's not really, that, and, and they get to keep their capabilities. Then the regional activities, I don't know how you deal with that. Honestly, I don't know. That, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, Patrick, did you have a, oh, that was, okay. I, and I think Corey wanted to add something. Yeah, please. I want to object to the description you just gave of the Iranian nuclear weapons program as essentially a symbolic program. Yeah. Is, do you actually think the program is no, symbolic? No, it's not symbolic, but if you, if you keep limits on, if you allow them only to have, you know, a couple hundred kilograms and, um, uh, you know, caps on our, you know, centrifuge R&D, so it is, becomes a symbolic program. Okay. That's, that's I what I draw my objective. So, so that they say face, we still got our centrifuges spinning, but it never exceeds more than a certain amount. That's, that's what I'm saying. So convert a weapons program to a symbolic kind of, you know, window dressing program so they could save face. And I think we, Pat, Patrick, you wanted to go. <clears throat> so uh, I'd be interested in our, our speaker's comments on uh, the complications of for both Iran and the United States in a gray zone approach. Um, after the UN restrictions on Iranian arms exports and imports expire on October 15th of this year, would you anticipate that uh, Iran is going to be interested in trying to reconstruct uh, its conventional forces on any scale? And um, what kind of gray zone activities of Iranian arms exports might you anticipate? And how is the United States going to respond to this? Just to point out, the, the part of the JCPOA was that the restri UN restrictions on arms exports and imports uh, would expire, and the date is October 15th this year. Yeah. Um, it would be so wonderful if our government had a strategy for dealing with Iran where the pieces aligned to capture that. But it obviously, it is an obvious point that an Iran suffering under the kind of uh, economic sanctions we have on it has an outsized incentive to be able to export any weapons to get any kind of revenue they possibly can, overtly, covertly. I'm skeptical that we'll see much reconstruction of their conventional forces just because I think uh, as Michael has proven so well, 
uh, the asymmetric approach is much more cost effective and much more um, uh, much less likely to produce the kind of escalation that Iran will avoid because they know that, as as General McKenzie, the CENTCOM commander, so eloquently puts it, um, we own the top steps of the escalation ladder. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, uh, actually I wrote for IISS a paper on this a couple of years ago, and, and my conclusion, which I, I, I still kind of stand by, but I don't think much has changed since then, is that, as, as Corey said, their way of war, relying on kind of um, this um, deterrence war fighting triad that, uh, you know, um, the ability to close the Strait of Hormuz, um, uh, precision strike in terms of drones and missiles, as well as uh, r proxies, has worked very well for them. So why would they want to build a large conventional military force? So anyhow, that would cost hundreds of billions of dollars. They'd have to totally recapitalize their force, tremendous investments in infrastructure that they don't have. Um, and right now, the system is creaking by with, you know, people protesting given, um, given you know, uh, the, the, the current state of the economy. So, but, but that said, and also they've done a remarkable job, despite the sanctions, to developing, you know, an indigenous capability as well as getting stuff from abroad in violation of all kinds of um, um, export control uh, regimes. Um, and so that will, con you know, that will continue, but they'll have a, a freer hand to kind of build niche capabilities and fill, up, fill in some of their gaps and modernize on a very selective basis. So they already have kind of a, a formidable capability given their kind of um, very focused approach, and I think this will only help it, but I don't expect to see a rebuild. Uh, but they'll build on success. I'd just jump in and, and put an exclamation point behind the comments that Mike made given the situation that they're in, given the current status of their conventional forces, um, I, I, don't, I don't see any motivation uh, on their part to increase resources if they became available into improving their conventional military. Yes, please. Right I'm Dan Pollock from the Zionist Organization of America. It sounds like as a layman I have a, a a lack of uh, consensus that you all have reached, and I don't quite get it, so I'm going to ask it explicitly even though it makes me look a little foolish. So the consensus sounds like there really isn't much chance of Iran choosing to engage the United States in any type of conventional conflict. But what is the reason, again, why we would not be able to use the idea of our superiority to kind of humiliate them and therefore exacerbate their domestic political situation, which the more their people are agitating against the government, the better. So why aren't we seeking, for example, to you know, demonstrate their inability to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with us in the Persian Gulf with so conventional I'll, forces? I'll start with an example last summer. The, the example I always use is the statement that the then National Security Advisor put out in his own name, John Bolton, on May 5th against the backdrop of intelligence streams suggesting, strongly suggesting or indicating that Iran was, was preparing attacks, identifying possible targets for attacks in the Gulf and in Iraq, U.S. personnel, facilities, et cetera. So Bolton issues a statement saying, uh, any attacks by Iran on U.S. interests or those of its partners will be met with unrelenting force. Exactly a week later, you had four limpet mine, the four tankers attacked with limpet mines. Two days later, you had the east-west Saudi pi pipeline, and then it went all through the summer. The U.S. didn't respond to any of those. Now you could argue, you, you could argue the merits of should it do so? How should it do so? It, is a Norwegian tanker that's been hit with a limpet mine um, is that a U.S. interest? Is it interest of our partner? Who who, who are our partners, and what are their interests. So that statement itself, I thought, um, almost begged the Iranians to begin doing what they were doing. Not, not that that literally caused it, but it was, it was a good example of putting a big warning out there and then Iran essentially saying, I'll take that bet. And we didn't respond, and that's a decision for both the CENTCOM commander, but then straight up the flagpole to Washington what do you want to respond to? And how are you going to argue to the American people, to the Congress, the, the purpose of what you're doing? And it was crystallized over the downing of the drone. President himself said, 
I thought about taking a shot. I was minutes away from taking a shot. I had my finger on the trigger. Well, I decided not to take the shot. Over the summer, the president and Secretary Pompeo uh, clarified a red line around U.S. citizens and to a lesser degree U.S. facilities, but U.S. citizens. And that was reiterated by SecDef um, on the heels uh, or just before and then after the, the killing of the American on December 27th. So that seems to be our red line. But are we going to be, are we going to follow, are we going to do a call and response with Iran over, you know, the, the, the time and the place of their choosing? And does that put pressure on the regime because we do what in response to limpet mines? So it, it, it is precisely the nature of the gray zone battlefield um, in which Iran is very practiced, which makes it very difficult for us to respond. I think Mike had some good ideas, but it still, it still leaves over the question of when you want, when an American president or a CENTCOM commander wants to, to respond to it. It wasn't, those were not attacks against us. So I think there are three reasons not to do what you suggest and humiliate the Iranian government into understanding that we could crush them under our heel. The first is that uh, the, if what we are trying to achieve is a different and a better Iran, I'm not sure that gets us there because you know national pride is a, is a difficult thing to imagine. What if that creates a rally around the flag uh, response, which was the initial response of Iranians after the Soleimani killing? before they realized the bumblingness of their own government um, in shooting down a civilian airliner. The second reason not to do it is we don't want to own the outcome, either morally or practically. What's the conveyor belt that gets from humiliating the Iranian government to a different, better Iran? And do we not bear some culpability for what happens in between those two things if we're a major agent in favor of it? And the third thing is that uh, Iran is not without power to do things that we and its neighbors and our friends want them not to do. So we may have the ability to crush Iran under our heel, but that doesn't mean they have no ability to do stuff that we don't want them to do. So we have limited interest in the game. The conveyor belt from doing that to a good outcome isn't very clear. And we actually care about what they could do to others in addition to what they could do to us. Yeah, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll condense it into a short answer. Uh, and, and that is it would be, there's not a real high degree of probability that we would understand the consequences of taking that sort of action. Nothing to add. Okay. Oh, well said. Questions? Yes. Could you speak up a little? Oh, yep. Washington Institute. Uh, a, a question to General Depula. Um, in light of the now demonstrated Iranian uh, missile capability and versatility, uh, don't you think uh, it's now the time to revive the the forward basing versus a prompt global strike debate. Um, you know, it, 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 there is an evident gap in the ability to, to defend the infra infrastructure and use assets in the region. I don't. C could you refine your question a little bit more? That in, in there has been, a, uh, you know, in the, in the past there has been this debate between the, whether to go for a forward basing uh, or, or prompt global strike, stay behind and, and uh, uh, strike from behind. Yeah, well, I mean, okay. Um, yeah, my response is we, we, there, there, no answer to military options is binary. Um, so it, and, and it, the, what we do in the context of defending our assets, I, I think that's the ultimate base of what you're getting at uh, in some of the discussion has been uh, is so highly situational dependent. Um, you know, there are good reasons to have a prompt global strike capability, but there are also good reasons to be forward-based. Now, if you're going to be forward-based, the bottom, what, what you're highlighting is the fact that uh, 
offensive uh, preci precision missile capabilities increase the susceptibility of forward-based forces, the, uh, of course. Um, do we need to develop adequate and sufficient resources to defend those facilities? And the answer I would suggest to you is, of course. Uh, and as technologies evolve, um, I think you are going to see a greater development and interest in uh, uh, expanding the kinds of capabilities that will allow us to do that much, much more effectively in the future than we have in the past. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Arash Saleh with the uh, Democratic Party of Iranian Kurdistan. So my question would be, considering the fact that Iran is not a homogeneous uh, society, what place do you think internal discontents and also uh, social chasms can play in the United States' approach toward Iran? Uh, well, I would argue, uh, I, I believe you can agree with me that, uh, you know, I Iran's behavior abroad is somehow interlinked with its nature inside. So without addressing this nature, I would say uh, it's just uh, kicking, kicking the can down the road. Thank you. So it can, uh, clarify, uh, just a point of clarification, are you asking, should the U.S. be seeking to, um, t to deepen those cleavages and internal points of friction in its policy approach to Iran? Is that the sense? How do you think that they can play a role in the United States' approach towards Iran? So they can certainly play a role, um, but uh, I have an aversion to us utilizing uh, in other countries things that we object to other countries utilizing in our own society. And given the way that the Russians, the Chinese, and others have been fomenting uh, racial and sectarian and religious discord in the United States, it's a pretty unpopular idea with me at the moment. I agree it's a, a tool, an effective tool of political warfare, um, and the Iranian government should be a lot more worried about it than it is. Uh, but I would argue for restraint on that, on the part of the United States just now. Yeah, I, I would second that emotion and go further and say that it also doesn't stop at the borders. So what you might, uh, as, a, as a government, try to exploit has a, has a potential to seep out and, and taint other other peoples and communities in, in, in the, the near beyond. But moreover, I think the, the, the flip side of that is that when that there are certainly ways uh, that when we look at a country like Iraq, um, which in which the, it's, it's a Shia-dominated set of protests against a Shia government uh, and uh, very much against uh, the Iran aspect of, or, or Iranian policies that are so entangled with corruption and, and, and poor governments and this malicious state in the making in Iraq. Um, and so there is a way to reflect in our policy approach and highlight um, the, the, um, the really dire nature of, U of uh, Iranian foreign policy for foreign audiences, including their own. And I think that's something that we, we ought to be doing a little more energetically. If, if I could just, just add just one quick point. I would just say that I, I agree with the previous, uh, my, my, my colleagues here, that I, I don't think it's desirable for the United States to play on kind of ethno-sectarian cleavages within Iranian society. But our focus should be on human rights and freedom. Yeah. And, and that's what we do. We do emphasize that. So and I think that's the right that's the right way to play the information operations game, and um, it's also consistent with our values. That said, I think we should hold out the prospect of a ramped up political warfare, unconventional warfare campaign in the event of dramatic escalation, rather than you know kind of um, or you know either you know in addition to holding out the prospect of escalation dominance in the conventional domain, which always should be kind of lurking in the background, no doubt. Though I have a preference for gray zone operations, you always want to bolster that with the potential for dramatic escalation in the conventional domain where we have an advantage. But also, I think what they fear more than even kind of a, a, a you know, dramatic air campaign, and they've, they've had a ringside seat to American air power, so I have no doubt that's something they would be, you know, have a, 
really dramatic impact on their calculus. But some, the one thing that they fear more than that, of you know, their being on the receiving end of an air campaign like Iraq was in, in 2003 and 1991, is an unconventional warfare campaign. Was the thing they fear most as revolutionaries, they fear nothing more than sedition and revolution. Okay, so that should be also he held held in response. The, uh, excuse me, held in in reserve. That if things really escalate, and they and they should understand, if things really escalate between the United States and Iran, then we then we might, you know, play that card, uh, provide you know provide arms or whatever to separatist groups. But again, I don't think that's something we should be doing in routine times. Um, that's only in in extremist kind of uh, policy option, from my point of view. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Yes. Thank you, uh, Alec Davison, Washington Institute. Uh, this is related to Iran strategy, but more so in the point of Iran and uh, exerting its influence greater throughout the region. And then you also see Turkey's rising militarism throughout the region. And in light of the uh, recent reports in The Intercept of reported meeting between the IRGC and the Muslim Brotherhood in Ankara. Do you see any chance in the near future of a greater alignment between Turkey and Iran to gain more influence in the Middle East? I don't, I don't follow Turkey much. I'll defer to others uh, here, although I'm, I'm skeptical, but. <laughs> yeah, I'm skeptical too. I think the uh, competition for influence between them is likely to be uh, to preclude that happening. I also think Syria. Well, something to worry about. Thank you for giving me another <laughs> thing not to go to sleep over. I also think Syria is the the battleground on which um, all of these uh, sort of transactional relationships between Moscow, Ankara, Tehran, Damascus, uh, certainly between the three of them and Ankara, are being frayed, and uh, the surge, the potential surge of refugees as an outcome uh, into Turkey or against Turkish borders um, as a result of the, the regime's uh, campaign in Idlib with Russian uh, and Iranian support is, is only going to cause further friction. Short answer, no. <laughs> hey, Erdogan's got too much on his plate uh, to now bring in the Persians to worry about and deal with. Last question. That was, that was the last question. Thank you very much. Thanks.